Hey everyone, you are listening to the Divergent Conversations podcast. We are two neurodivergent mental health professionals in a neurotypical world. I'm Patrick Cassell. And I'm Dr. Neff. And during these episodes, we do talk about sensitive subjects, mental health, and there are some conversations that can certainly feel a bit overwhelming. So we do just want to use that disclosure and disclaimer before jumping in. And thanks for listening. If you're looking to grow your business and get in front of a new audience, Divergent Conversations is accepting new sponsors for the 2024 seasons. We already have over 300,000 downloads and counting all over the world, and this podcast is growing all of the time. The beauty of podcast sponsorship is that you can get live pre-roll or mid-roll opportunities where we will read your ad on air while recording, getting you in front of a new audience every single week. You have the opportunity to sponsor one month of episodes at a time where you'll get four episodes in total, or you can sponsor an entire year and be the exclusive sponsor of Divergent Conversations. This is a podcast that's being distributed all over the world. The analytics are fantastic. The podcast is growing and it is a very captive audience. Reach out to us directly via the link in our website at divergentpod.com or email us at divergentconversationspodcast at gmail.com and we can get started on your sponsorship journey. Hey everyone, we are back with another episode of the Divergent Conversations podcast. And today we have Lyric Rivera, founder of Neurodivergent Consulting and author of the best-selling business ethics book, Workplace Neurodiversity Rising, named Trend for 2023 and praised in Forbes as an excellent how-to manual based on lived experience and professional competence. Lyric also runs the blog Neurodivergent Rebel and is known as a pioneer of the hashtag asking autistics hashtag where simple questions prompt open-ended questions that autistic people can quickly chime in with and invites participants to engage each other in conversations related to the topic. Sorry, stumbling over my words. Um, We're really happy to have you on and we're going to talk about workplace culture and your book and and a lot of these things. And, And as you mentioned before we started recording, what people often get wrong, which I think is super practical and really, really a valuable conversation. I just want to say I've been following your social media for a couple of years now and I've loved the journey and I just love how authentic you are and how you show up. And I just, I feel like it's an honor for you to be here. So thank you for coming on and making the time. Well, thank you. I am honored to be here. I I, I really appreciate you inviting me and I look forward to diving into the conversation. So thank thank you. So um, where do we want to start with this topic? Because you've written a book. It's obviously gotten a lot of acclaim. And I think you should just take it away. Like what prompted the writing of this book? Why does it feel so important to you? I know that's a huge question. Yeah, well, I found out I was autistic when I was 29 years old and then the ADHD diagnosis was a few years later. And I started working with in the family business when I was like 11. So I'd been in the workplace for well over 15 years by the time I finally found out I was autistic. And suddenly with that new knowledge in my head, because I, I, you know, I'd been in a lot of different fields and I've had a lot of different management roles already. And I could just suddenly see where all of the, pretty much all the struggles I've had in any workplace had to do with being autistic and having that not empowered and having it treated as if it was a problem. And I could just see all the ways I had failed because I didn't understand this about my brain and because the workplaces weren't willing to flex to me and treated me like I was a problem. Uh, And so just all of the things in my head that I just suddenly were so clearly wrong with all the workplaces I could see and all the ones I'd been through and all the ones I was in currently, uh, it's just the things that like wouldn't let go in my head, which is kind of what drove me to get into doing the independent consulting in this area too, because it's, it's like a, a very autistic stereotype that I fit is I've latched onto this problem that these workplaces are broken and I can't turn it off. Like I just, I need to fix the problem. And so until the problem is fixed, I'm just stuck on it. And it became really clear to me within the first year of being solo in my consulting business on my own, that I, one person cannot go fix all of the workplaces or even a real reasonable fraction of them by myself. 
because that's just one person. And so I really wanted something that was like a guidebook that was really actionable and easy for people to take and start making immediate change without you know, getting me involved or, or anyone, hopefully they could get their, their employees involved and start making these changes for, you know, almost nothing because the ebook is like $9.99 and the, the paperback is like $12.99 depending on your country. So it's like really cheap. So it's like a lot of businesses are like, oh, we can't afford to make changes. It's like, well, I've made it so cheap. You really have no excuse not to start making at least some of the changes that really just cost time and energy. So that, that was like the birth of the book. Because I wanted it to be so easy that these businesses didn't have an excuse anymore not to start making immediate changes. <laughs> I love that. I love that as an orange origin story too. Um, I jotted something down as you were writing this, this would diverge us too much, but I'm just going to say this one thought, which is like, we should talk sometime about like fix the world stress or fix the world anxiety. Cause when you said that of like, <laughs> and then my brain and I couldn't turn it off. I was like, yep. Yep. And I see that all the time. Right. Like, I think that is such a source of, well, on one hand, stress and struggle and anxiety, because we see these things, we see the systemic problems, we see kind of what needs to change. Um, but on the other hand, like what you've done here, a source of meaning, like you've been able to create a, a career, you created a really accessible resource, like to be able to bring that to the world can be such a source of meaning as well. So I just... I just love the origin story of how you got into this. Thank you. And I'm hoping it's something that will like, you know, at this point now it's in print, it's out there forever and it'll outlive me and it'll keep doing the thing long after I'm gone, hopefully back on wood. <laughs> Absolutely. So you made it cheap. You made it accessible. What are we seeing people so often get wrong when it comes to all things workplace culture? And again, I realize I'm asking really big questions and like we could do hours of episode on what did people get wrong. But I want to kind of jump to that because you kind of emphasized that before we started recording. So what comes to mind? The, the, the number one thing that people get wrong is everyone always comes to me asking, I want to start a neurodiversity hiring initiative, or I want to attract more neurodivergent talent. They want to like start getting neurodivergent seats in their in, in butts in their chairs, but they are taking for granted that they have an environment that exists now that might not be ready, or very likely they have neurodivergent people in their employee in employment right now at this very moment. Uh, and so really the question is, they should be asking first is, do you have neurodivergent people in your organization right now? And if, if so, like, are they open about it? Or are they feeling like they're unsafe to mention it? Like, do you not know? Because in, if you don't know, why don't you know? Why, why aren't people like feeling safe to discuss this? Um, or, do pe or is your workplace really naturally accommodating and people don't need to disclose it because, you know, they feel it's a non-issue. That's also something that can happen. Um, or if you really have no neurodivergent people right now in your workplace, your system's got to be really bad because you're weeding them out somehow or they're not sticking around. So like you've got to really look at the environment as it exists now and what your current organization or organizational policy and cultures are. Uh, because, you know, if you think of it like coming to transplant some flowers or some plants and you don't first prepare the soil and the environment and you get everything ready for these new plants to come survive, your plants are going to die. Uh, and you've wasted all that effort. And if you are, and I also have a background, like part of my background is recruiting and hiring. And that's a really expensive loss when you onboard someone and they leave. It's really expensive. And if you're doing that over and over again, you are wasting so much money, which is like, we, we don't need to be focusing on hiring. You need to be focusing on what what's your environment like right now? Because if you fix the environment, you fix the culture, you have a, a place that is safe for neurodivergent people to work, they're gonna tell other people, this is a great place to work, word will spread, like the, the word will get out. Uh, but if, if you bring a bunch of people in, you're just, you're wasting all that effort if you haven't fixed the environment first. I love that so much, like cultivate the ecosystem first. I actually, I've seen this in, um more my context has been in different looking at different training programs but where there'll be efforts to bring in particularly um like one 
that was that I saw a lot of waves of maybe five, 10 years ago was um, to actively recruit more BIPOC students because the mental health field is very, um, historically, it's a very white profession. Um, but not doing that work first of how do we create a system where when we bring them in, this is actually a psychologically safe place for them. So I mm -hmm. love what you're saying is like, we actually have to start with the ecosystem and what are you building before just like, let's fill these seats with these identities that we want. Yeah, there's there's physical, you know, sensory safety, there's policies, there's, there's an emotional safety. That's a really big piece that a lot of organizations want to skip and don't even look at is the emotional safety, which which is the other big mistake is they're, they're not understanding that people have to feel safe to be able to speak up when they have a need. And if people feel as if they are going to be ridiculed, scolded, or speaking up about what they need or their actual feelings is going to react poorly on their on them and it's going to make them... Uh, you know, face punishment or something, they're going to hold back and they're not going to be willing to share because they're going to be like, this isn't safe. Uh, and so emotional safety is a really huge piece, not just for neurodivergent people, but for anyone who has a disability because they need to be able to be vulnerable because there's environments out there where if you do have a disability and you get accommodations, everyone's like, oh, why do they get special treatment? And that was what I encountered when I found out I was autistic. I was like, I finally have this diagnosis. I have this label. I'm going to be able to get accommodation. But then it was like, everyone wants what you're asking for. It wouldn't be fair to give you special treatment. Yeah, which I, I wish I would have said it, but I didn't have the, the, the fortitude that I have now. <laughs> that if everyone wants what I'm asking for, your system must be really terrible because your system sucks. I wish I would have said it. You know, in hindsight, but th that's where we are. The systems are are terrible, um, and the neurodivergent people are the canaries in the coal mine in a lot of circumstances. Yeah, that's so true. I watched myself and Megan both start laughing when you said that because it was just like, yeah, this is ridiculous. And you're right; the system is the systems are terrible. So, if we're not cultivating this ecosystem, if we're not creating something really foundationally sound and learning and growing and adapting it the culture will never get created because it's so hard to do that if you don't create that foundation and if you don't do so with that purpose and that intention and that includes everything right like policies procedures interview processes hiring processes like all of the ways that you set up your workplace environment so like there's so much to this and there's so much that gets missed and it's so much more than just being like we're going to slap a label on our website and that's kind of going to be it. Yeah, it's not a one and done. And I think people expect it will be a one and done. Uh, and, and it's a lot more than that. It's like at first, like starting the conversation, you know, and letting people know that you're a safe organization, but you can't just start the conversation and let people know you're safe if your actions say otherwise. So there's a whole lot that you have to address and, you know, start the doing a training of neurodiversity 101 or something like that. It's just, it's just the first step. It's just a conversation starter. Uh, and, and, you know, that might bring up some really tricky conversations in organizations, like things they weren't ready to face or deal with yet, uh, w which is another scary thing, I think, sometimes because they have to be really ready to take action when people start saying, hey, there are these problems. Uh, because if we don't say, Oh, there's a, there's a, if we don't take action when our, our employees are telling us we have problems, then they're just going to feel unheard, and then everyone's look, like the problem has been made made away, and we're all just like, oh, look at this big problem nobody wants to do anything about. So, you know, there's there's definitely some uh, delicacy to jumping into the situations too. But uh, you know, we know when people are trying. The thing that's popping in my head and maybe this exists, but it's like an inventory that like leadership would take of like, are you ready for a neurodiverse work team? And it would have questions like, um, you know, are you ready to hear honest feedback from employees? And, and I have some of those questions that would prompt them to like deeply think about what would it mean to intentionally be recruiting a more neurodiverse um, work team? Um, as Because yeah, I think and, and understandably, if if this isn't a world you're in, I think people don't often realize what that means to cultivate a neurodiverse team 
where there's a lot of different brain styles thinking very differently about things? Um, and are they actually asking those questions of like, it, is our culture ready for this? Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of them too, like they, they, they don't necessarily understand how to let yet like assume the good intentions either. Like they think they know, but then it's like, you know, they're like, oh, this person is, is, is being lazy or this person just isn't doing their work. And it's like, well, like, do you understand? Like, have you assumed they're just being lazy or are you assuming that their brain works the same way your brain works because they're doing something that's hard for them and takes away more energy than and it's something that's easy for you. So it's like we have to like really just retrain people how to think because we've got this like this bias that we think everyone's brain works the way our brains work. Uh, and, and we don't. And see, I thought this way when I didn't know I was autistic. Uh, and that was really to my detriment. And when I didn't know about my ADHD, like that was really to my detriment because I saw Same. other people around me and it was like, they made everything look so easy. And I'm like, well, I'm a, a massive mess up because this is hard for me. Why is this a thing hard for me? My The biggest way this got me in trouble in the workplace was just saying what I meant and assuming everyone else was doing the same. Um, and that got me in trouble in different, in like different <laughs> work settings, especially because I've been in these kind of more professional workspaces and I would mm -hmm. just be really, really authentic. And I think a couple of things were happening. One, like obviously people weren't doing the same thing, but then I had this realization after my diagnosis of like, people were probably reading into what I was saying, me, thinking I was saying more than I was because, because I was being so face value that, um, yeah. Yeah. So that whole, like realizing other brains don't work like mine, that has been a big aha moment and realizing a lot of my work clashes came down to just assuming other people were showing up in a similar way, which they absolutely were not. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I, I got in trouble, uh, in one workplace, it's like I, I'm like performance reviews. I would have things like, "Oh, there was a typo in that internal email." There, and it would be like, "Oh, your your body language on site of that client event, or your 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 posture was not very proper." And you know, you kept having your arms crossed. I'm like, "Cold outside." Of course, I'm cold. I'm not gonna, say, you know. I mean, it was like things like you know that my like I was I was being critiqued on like not smiling enough and like just just strange like you know things that like made me just like so hyper self-aware and then it was like uh, uh like uh, you know i as an autistic person i really need to recharge on my lunch breaks for example uh and so it's like i don't want to go sit in the break room with everybody sitting at the table like conversation with like eight people at lunch that's not not gonna like help me take a break so i can continue the other half of my work day so i would like go sit by myself outside where it's quiet with trees and then I would get in trouble for not being social with my coworkers and not having a bond with my coworkers and not making enough effort to make friends with my coworkers because I needed to actually use my lunch break for, for me. I needed to have my time. Uh, and it's just like these these expectations, like some some people really need all that social connection at work. But, you know, a lot of times the employees that are a little bit less social, like we get punished and scolded or people think we don't like our coworkers, or you know things like that. it's like no I'm just I'm just tired I just literally need a break I need to use my break for a break uh, and so there's a lot of misunderstandings because they other people apparently recharge sitting in a, in a group of people like that's relaxing for some people not me Megan <laughs> you know? and I were talking about this when it comes to like workplace social events that would happen after hours or like team holiday parties or whatever and you're like dreading this so much but if you don't go then all of a sudden like you said lyric you're not really a team player you don't really enjoy your coworkers. all the things that come up with that i used to struggle so much and i still would if i was in a, a nine to five traditional like typical setting why do i have to be here at nine in the morning like why do i have to do this why if i can get my work done in three to four hours a day why do i have to sit here for eight hours i don't understand and those are the types of questions that would get me into trouble all the time. And like, those are the types of situations I would find myself in and cultivating, like looking at your hours and the, the reason behind your policies and procedures is so crucial when we're talking about this stuff. Like for our group practice, I just interviewed someone 
and they said, what are your hours? I said, what do you want them to be? Because honestly, I, I want to make it accessible for you and your system and what you need. I don't sleep well, as so many of us don't. So like, if I'm going to start my day before 10 a.m., it's just not going to happen. And I just want to be really aware of that too, because these are the little things that we can build into our, our culture and our infrastructure that go such a long way in supporting people's systems and their needs too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And custom collecting a schedule is, is really important for neurodivergent people. And that was another thing you remind me of that people don't think of when they're building these schedules is that like you are very likely the tasks you're good at, it probably takes you half the time or you can do the work of two people doing that task because it's like you're, you're really skilled in that area. That's how it is for me. Like the stuff I'm good at, I'm really good at. I can do it you know, way quicker than most people I know. But the stuff that other people think is real simple sometimes, tedious, the stuff they take for granted that they can do so easily, that's the hard stuff for me, you know? And, and that's going to take me longer and it's going to take me way more energy and way more motivation to do that. Uh, and so, you know, when I worked uh, in organizations where that was a problem and it was just like I was scolded for taking longer at doing things that were harder for me and it completely was ignored that I could do a lot of things way faster. Uh, but then at the same time, like in another organization where that wasn't a problem, they would just have us have people that were that liked the tasks we were not so good at do the, the do those tasks and people that were good at that stuff. It's like we divided our work better because we were mindful of what each person was good at and let them do the thing they're good at. And then we let them either outsource or have a team member collaborate when they had a weakness. Like that's a really nice neurodiversity informed way of working, letting everyone do the work they actually really enjoy. And then everyone can like their job because they're doing things that are to their skills. Uh, and so it makes it better for everyone, not just your neurodivergent team members, you know? Absolutely. I, um, and that, I mean, that reminds me of, I can't, oh, I'm blanking on the study now. Um, actually, I think it was in maybe Adam Grant's book about, um, he's a organizational psychologist. So kind of what makes organizations work well and talking about diversity. It wasn't exactly about neurodiversity, but it was diversity of thought about how those groups often encounter more friction but then end up coming to like a better conclusion. And so this idea that having different thinking styles, different brain styles, right? Like that this, this is a good, this gets back to like the core of the neurodiversity mm -hmm. paradigm. Like this is a good thing. Um, it's good. We're not all autistic. It's good. We're not all ADHD. It's good. We're not all neurotypical. Like it's so good that we get to have this beautiful diversity and lean on one another. Like, um, my spouse and I do this all the time of I lean on his executive functioning like no other. And I'm the entrepreneur that has a lot of like creative ideas. And yeah, so I I just love that vision of what you're showing of a team where it's like we all get to lean into our strengths and be better when we do that. And, and that's really what I think if we if we had perfect communities, that's what our perfect communities would look like, right? We would all support each other and we would do the things we were good at and we would all bring, you know, what we are naturally inclined to do to the table. Uh, and, you know, that's how our relationship is too. My partner and I were both called EHD, autistic ADHD, uh, but we have very different strengths and weaknesses, even though we both are similar in our neurotypes because... Uh, we're, we're just different people, you know, no two people with the same neurotype are exactly the same. Um, so it is really beautiful that I have weaknesses, my partner doesn't and vice versa. And it was really wonderful. Um, sorry about that guys. Uh, it was really, really wonderful. Um, you know, you know, one thing I'll say, Megan is like, we recently just got done doing, um, individual check-ins within my group practice with our clinicians. And I just ask them, like, we have a communications form that we have people use when they come on board and they can do it anonymously if they want, or they can just submit it. Preferred communication styles. And that can be like, mm -hmm. I really like getting phone calls. I really like going on Zoom. I like having um, text conversations, stuff like that. So I was doing like one-on-one -on -one check ins with some of my clinicians via text because I was like, do you want to, do you want to do this without having, um, 
communication or any sort of verbal communication today? And they'd say, absolutely. If that can happen, that would be wonderful. Some people would request phone calls. Some people would request video calls. And those are, again, these little details that we are overlooking so often. And if we are in environments um, of employment where it's like, well, why would we do that? That's not how we can measure progress or success. Or we're looking at it from this very ableist lens or we're, we're looking at it from a very neurotypical uh, perspective, it gets lost in translation. Like some of my clinicians don't need to, to call me to tell me what's going on. Like we can have text conversations and we can go over the last three months of everything that they've been doing and support each other that way. And it gives my voice a break too, which is a blast. So it's just like, I'm just so fascinated by trying to continuously like figure out as many ways that we can if, create affirming workplace culture as possible. Yeah, there's so many different ways. Like like right now, I'm working with a couple different people. Like we're working asynchronously, you know? So I check in on a document uh, a certain time of day when I'm fresh and they check in on the document a different time of day when I'm fresh. And we each check in about once every 24 hours and we just go behind and pass notes back and forth. And, you know, we're, we're accommodating how, we, how each other works. There are other people that, like I said, we hop on Zoom calls and it's a really nice way to work. It's like, what do you need to be the best version of yourself? You know, what what time of day are you freshest? What, uh, you know, how do you communicate best? You know, I, some people, we do emails. I don't do chats on social media. Like I can't keep up with those inboxes. <laughs> you know, so I'm like, I'm not going to do that, sorry. Uh, because if it's been marked red, then I'm going to forget about it. You know, executive functioning, not there. Uh, but I know, I know my weaknesses, you know, and uh, being able to be unapologetic with, my weaknesses has been really empowering because for the first 29 years of my life, when I didn't know I was autistic and ADHD, I was hiding those weaknesses and just trying to downplay them and just trying to make sure they didn't show because I felt like they were something I had to be ashamed of. And now it's like, I'm going to need help with that. And I, and now, because I know to ask for help or I say, Hey, that's, that's a hard no for me. Like I actually get the help I need <laughs> for like most of my life. I wasn't getting any help. So, uh, it, it's, it's, just the difference between success and failure for me. I love how you bring in the piece about like being, I can't remember quite how you said it, but kind of being comfortable with your limits or your weaknesses. Like I talk about that a lot with, with burnout is like, we have to grieve our limits to build a life that actually works for us. Um, mm -hmm. But that's so true with the workplace too, to like build a, a work like a work rhythm, work practices that work for us. Like we've got to get to a place of of comfort or acknowledgement of like what is hard for me. Like for me, executive functioning is really, really hard. Organization is really, really hard. And coming to terms with that and like figuring out, okay, what is it, what accommodations do I need um, because of that? But yeah, that takes, I don't know what it takes takes vulnerability, takes grief. I mean, it's not fun to look at that stuff. But burnout's what led me to figuring this out too. Like I was in an extreme burnout. And like, after you've been in burnout for so long, eventually it kind of becomes depression, at least in my experience, because it becomes helpless. It feels really help hopeless. And you're like, this is, this is my life forever. I don't know how I can get out of this. I'm stuck. And like, it becomes really hopeless. And so I had become, I first became burned out and then it became burned out and depressed. Uh, and I was really in this really bad on physically unhealthy mentally unhealthy uh place when I found out I was autistic and it was because of this workplace that just like everything about me being autistic was a problem and so I just after months of it just began to internalize I was the problem I felt like I was just the problem and I just I it hit me so hard and then realizing my brain really was different and just realizing that even though everyone was telling me I need to try harder and apply myself more and just do more and do more and do more, I realized I had been trying harder and doing way more than everyone else. And it just wasn't being seen because my brain was different. And it was just that aha moment for me that just kind of stopped that way of looking at myself and let me develop, I think, self-compassion for probably the first time in my entire life because I had no self-compassion because nobody around me had given me compassion. So I didn't give myself compassion. I, so I, I say this a lot, Lyric, I say like, this is, I think one of the greatest gifts of a diagnosis or identification is access to self-compassion. I'm absolutely the same way. I had such a brutal self-critic, like a self-critic on steroid 
who was like trying to protect me, right? Because if I can criticize myself before others, it's adaptive, but not really. Um, and yeah, absolutely. And I see this all the time that like people finally are able to access a way of being gentle with themselves, self-compassion for the first time after having this, this lens. And I think that's one of the most powerful things I see. It's, it's, yeah. It's a wake up call, but then it's also like now it's like I've, I've known for seven years and I don't feel that way about myself anymore, but I've still got all those patterns from 29 years of treating myself badly and like, as if I'm not worthy of self-care, as if my needs don't matter. And so I'm still trying to break all of those habits that developed in my life from a lifetime of like really believing I wasn't enough mm -hmm. and didn't deserve comfort even, which is so sad to see. It's like, even though I don't see that anymore, it's like the patterns are still there. So like, you know, how, how long am I going to be working <laughs> back to fix all that, you know, and how many other neurodivergent people are out there going through similar or, or like my brain always goes to all the, all the ones that might not figure out their neurodivergent in their lifetimes, you know, because I, I've got family members, uh, older generations, especially that are really resistant to that kind of information. Um, and I just wish everyone could just like, I'm just going to wake you all up like, hey, hey, please come on. Like, cause it, it is so um, just life changing to have that self-compassion. Mm -hmm. And I just wish everyone could have that for themselves. Uh, and it's just like, yeah. I see, you know, almost 30 years of my life where I just didn't have that at all. And it's just like, oh, I just want to hug that little person that isn't there anymore, yeah. that little, little kid me. Um, because even as a kid, you know, it wasn't really there. Mm -hmm. It's so yeah. hard when it wasn't there as a kid. And if you, like you said, didn't have anyone to show that to you or to model that for you. And then you go through life, like thinking consistently, like, what is off with, like, what is wrong with me? Why is it me who just doesn't get this or doesn't access this? And then all of a sudden it's a completely different lens to see the world through. That doesn't make it any, that much easier at times, but I am so grateful to have pursued diagnosis at 35 years old because yeah. 35 years just did not add up for me. It didn't make sense. And I just was at this point where I was like, I really don't know what else to fucking do at this mm -hmm. point in time. And that's the thing. It's like, it makes everything suddenly make sense. Like, oh my gosh, everything like makes sense. Now, like all the things that really didn't make any sense, like in my life, suddenly it was like, I had this missing piece of information. And it was like, oh, all of this stuff that happened made sense. You know, the bullying, uh, why my teachers were just so upset by just the way I was, like just the way I existed, like angered my teachers, just the way, you know, I presented myself, just the way I moved. Like, I was like, why? Like, I didn't understand. And it's like, at least I know why now. Um, but then it's like that hindsight, like, okay, now I need to fix that, that fix the world anxiety you were talking about. Like, gotta fix the world. It's real. It's real. I like... So I, I beat all y'all. I was 37. So I was, was the oldest of the bunch um, when I found out. But yeah, it is. It's so much like, like those neural pathways are so etched in after all those years. I will. Um, so I, I always love these email exchanges. I, in the last year, I've gotten a lot of emails from like 80 year old women who are discovering oh. this about themselves right now, um, like 70 and 80. And I just, it hits me because I think about the grief I had of like, oh my goodness, all, like 37 years of, you know, neural wiring to try and rewire and all of this time without this lens. And then I think about being, you know, toward end of life and discovering that and having 80 years, like I had so much to unpack. I remember I bumped up my therapy to twice weekly when I was processing this because I was unpacking so, so much from 37 years, but can y'all imagine unpacking 80 years? That's a lot, you know, and yeah, it's hard to imagine. I mean, but I, I, I hear like my readers, they are finding out in their thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, like you said, seventies beyond, like it, it's not a limit. And especially you think about like, like autism, just as an example, because I know the timelines, like we didn't start really screening everybody until like 2006. I think. And it was pediatric visits that they started like screening. And that's in the US uh, where they started screening at like 18 months and two years or something like that. Uh, and I was in 2000, I was 2006. I graduated in 2005. So 
Like I was already out of high school. So that's my generation. I'm 37 right now. Uh, and so they weren't scanning people who are in their 30s right now. Uh, they definitely weren't, you know, looking for people that were older. And then before that, like the definition of autism was so narrow in those previous generations where unless you were what now would be kind of like autism plus, like autism and additional disabilities on top of autism, that there's just, there's quite a few that are common. Unless you have those, you know, really additional complex disabilities, you wouldn't have been labeled autistic back then. Mm -hmm. Whereas right. now they recognize that there's kind of some core features uh, and then, you know, there are additional disabilities that are really common, but we don't all have all of the disabilities that are common in autistic people. Um, and then, you know, they also realize that some of us, like we have this trajectory where we struggle more at different times in our life, uh, depending on a lot of different things that has to do with our support and um, just what else we've got going on, how much stress and all of that. And, uh, so, you know, we at least know it's a little bit more complicated now and that the, the, the functioning is a bit fluid and can depend on a lot of factors. Uh, but back then, the knowledge was just so, so limited. And there was also so much stigma with autistic people specifically where like in the 50s and probably even in the 60s and like Temple Grandin, I don't know how old Temple Grandin is, like of her age, they were just institutionalizing them. Like that was the advice, just lock her away and forget about her. Um, and that, so a lot of parents wouldn't have wanted uh, their kids to be screened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, in school, I was in elementary school and they did want to screen me for learning disabilities. And just because of fear and the stigma, my guardians were like, no, you're not. You're just, you just want to label this kid. Like they didn't understand. Like there were other labels being thrown on me anyway. Uh, not so nice ones, label, you know, really terrible words and horrible things people were saying. Um, but they, they were trying to protect me because, you know, they came from that generation where it was, you know, potentially like dangerous. So, you know, it's, it's hard for some of those people in that generation. Um, but maybe, you know, something I think about is I do realize if I would have been diagnosed sooner, uh, it was probably a lot more likely I would have been put through a lot more strict behavior modification because that would have been pretty standard back then. Uh, they probably would have segregated me more in the school system. So there's things I'm grateful I didn't have to go through because I didn't know. Um, and so the older generations, they probably had some really things they're really grateful they didn't go through uh, because it was even worse. So I, so I have a community um, and I, every week I have like a conversation prompt and a couple of weeks ago I asked what if you had a time machine like when would you have wanted to know um and most people in the community not everyone but most most folks are autistic ADHD and a really interesting pattern showed up a lot of us said actually and for all those cultural reasons you just mentioned and more a lot of us said I think I found out about my autism at the right age which is typically adulthood but I wish I'd known about the ADHD earlier um, and that's how yeah, I feel. No kidding. <laughs> and it's so in it was really interesting to see that pattern emerge. Um, and it makes, yeah, I mean, that's absolutely how I feel. ADHD medication and support would have been so helpful and and not all of the challenges that would have come with being a diagnosed autistic person in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Yeah. We've come a long way. And even honestly, in the last like seven years since I've been diagnosed, I feel we've come a really long way because when I was first diagnosed and I wanted to go find other autistic people online or just read more autistic stories because I was recommended a couple books and I fed, I read them, they were gone real quick and I wanted more. And then I went and Googled autism and it was all, you know, really negative, bloom and doom, um, parents complaining about their kids. There was nothing for adults or late identified late diagnosed people uh and there just really wasn't like we have a lot of communities now we have a lot of like neurodivergent run blogs and spaces now that these weren't things that would come up in google search or in the web results back then it was like we all we had were like some hashtags on twitter and tumblr to like kind of find each other but if you didn't know how to search like you wouldn't have found these things mm -hmm. which are a lot easier to find now thank goodness but uh that's that's only been seven years so you know, that's kind of exciting to see just that much of a change because even even now, like people back then didn't really understand like respectful language for autistic people. Uh, it was still, even though you still see it from time to time, you still saw a lot of people using puzzle piece logos to represent autistic people. Like you saw that 
everywhere back then. And now it's like things are a lot more respectful and autistic people are leading more of the conversations. Uh, when seven, seven to 10 years ago, it was like everything was about mm -hmm. us and we weren't being included in our own stories and our own narratives. So like that, that's a big, uh, a big win. And just having control over being able to tell our own stories now uh, I think that'll that'll be really big for us over the next you know ten years, hopefully. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I I kind of that's one thing I like about your work is you have yeah. this perspective of you've been in the autistic advocacy space a while. Like, so I think I started creating resources maybe three three years ago ish, and I remember like you were one of the handful of accounts like even three years ago, it was really different than it is today. Yeah. And I remember like you were one of the um, handful of accounts where it's like, there's a lot of good resources coming out, a lot of education. And you, like you've been in here for, yeah, like seven, seven years. Like you've seen it sh have a huge shift in your time in this space. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of the people who were around when I started that like I found the few resources that I found or that popped up around that time don't even still do it anymore. It's just such a, it's a, it's fierce, a high burnout. Space. It is. Yeah. I was literally, I almost was late to this meeting because I was just responding to someone about this topic of like, I'm seeing autistic creators burn out really quickly. And I'm this year, I'm doing a lot of deep thinking around boundaries and like how to stay in this space and keep information accessible, but also honor like, boundaries of my own mind and nervous system um and it's it's hard and it's yeah i am have seen and am seeing a lot of creators um burn out so yeah yeah so you've been you've hard. been here for seven years so you must be doing something <laughs> i'm just stubborn no i just know it's hard because like they eat each other alive too sometimes you know which is really sad. And that just kind of breaks my heart. And I think maybe that's like, I, I don't want, I try not to get involved in those kinds of yeah. things. Like I'm just like in my own little bubble, just like, I'm just going to make my stuff and do my things and put it out and that's it. And that's, I think that's, the, that's how that's I what stay. I do. No, Lyric, that's what I do. I like, um, I'm, I deep focus well. And so I'm like, I'm going to go deep dive into research and create something and put it out. But like, I don't do the bopping. Um, or the, like, I don't do much of the people in unless it's in a really structured, intentional space. Um, so that's really interesting. That's how I've learned to be able to be sustainable in this world, too. In the beginning, I tried joining a bunch of groups and all these things. And it just, like, I realized it wasn't really, it wasn't for me. It was just too much of the the social stuff that is just, even with other autistic people with group dynamics. Like, for me, that was just overwhelming. I've also got a social anxiety diagnosis. So that probably has something to do with it. But, like, I'm good in a work context and a very professional. Like, we're, we're working together on a project or, you know, we're both, we're doing a collaboration on something and we're working towards a common goal. That's a bit easier for me, but then it's like, put me in a group with 50 people or thousands of people. I'm like, no, but this is just, this is too much. So I'm having, okay, I'm having a thought. I'm going to cross pollinate our ideas we've been talking about now. I'm going <laughs> to try and weave them together. Here's my thought I, that just popped in my head. Like the spaces in the groups, like autistic spaces, autistic advocacy spaces, are we thinking through in the same way we're talking about, like, how do we make workplaces neurodiversity affirming? Are we thinking through how to make those spaces neurodiversity affirming no. and affirming of autistic communication styles? They're not really affirming and they're not very intersectional. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like that, that's, that's precisely the problem. And, you, you know, and some people aren't in a space where they're ready to engage in a way that is safe for other people. And then I think the problem is a lot of the people who start these groups are in a place where they know how to create those kinds of safe spaces, you know? And so like people get excited. Oh, I just want to start a group. And like, it's a great idea, but a lot of people don't realize what they, what Kenya Borms are opening and these groups can grow. Like I had a group for, for a while when I first started on Facebook and it went from like, you know, 50 people to like 7,000 people within a few months. It was like, ah, you know, I, I, I panicked. I closed it. I'm like, I can't do this. I was like, wasn't ready for that. Uh, and I realized really quickly, like, 
because if you're having a group, you have to keep everybody safe. Like you have the mm-hmm. responsibility for keeping people safe. And that's just not physical safety. That is like emotional safety. There's like all of that. Uh, and I didn't feel like with, I was like capable of taking care of what really mm-hmm. needs to be done to keep a group to where people really would be safe. Because really like ideally people have to be online 24 seven or something like that. Yeah. And who has absolutely. the time for that? Yeah. Or, you know, you have a team of unpaid moderators mm-hmm. with good intentions, but, you know, a lot, you know, it's, it's still just, it's, it's kind of tricky and we need community spaces really, really bad. Like we really need them. We, we do. It's such a huge part of our healing. I think is finding those spaces. And I think, yeah, I mean, just because we're all autistic doesn't mean we're creating a space that's autistic friendly. And I think, oh yeah, no. Yeah, sort of. I I really hope that that's something that our community sorts out in the coming years is how do we create autistic friendly autistic spaces and that are digital, yeah. which um, because that's most yeah. accessible for many of us. And I think we will. I think we, you know, like we said, like seven years ago, we didn't really have a way to gather and collect each other yeah. and find each other, right? So we've only really known how to find each other for probably the past five years or less. And so we've got a lot of growing pain, like as a community, as any community does. Now we've got to figure out how to engage nicely with one another uh, and not, you know, and be mindful of the traumas that a lot of us have endured and the way we bring our own traumas into things. And, you know, that, that's hard because even, you know, when I started engaging, when I even, when I started my blog, like I had so much crap I brought to that with me where maybe I wasn't even always the safe person. I, I can admit that looking back it's like when you you start you don't kind of know and I came with all my wounds and everything very raw it's when it, you know people say oh, you're, you're very real you're very raw it's like you know it's like kind of wear my heart on my sleeve here because trying to conceal everything you know pretty much almost killed me so like that rawness is something I hope other people um, can, can appreciate but at the same time uh, you know, it's too much sometimes for some people. So it's interesting um, being all out there on the internet because the internet's forever, right? All the mistakes, everything, uh, it's all forever. That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, but it's been an interesting process. Hmm. Okay, if we were... And I don't know, this is perhaps not a fair question. And please tell me if so. Perhaps that's too like, maybe this is too much of a, an attempt to like tie it up neatly in a bow, which I don't really believe in, but here we go. Um, if you were consulting with a new organization or consulting with an autistic like space community and you were like, here are you know three things or five things you can do to increase psychological, emotional, sensory safety in your community. What are some of the, what are some of the things that you would prompt them to consider? I would really want them to consider doing some kind of a survey of the community members to see what areas the community members actually feel are unsafe. Also looking at the intersectionality of your community because autism doesn't know and neurodiversity, neurodivergent brain types. We don't have gender barriers. We don't have race barriers. Mm-hmm. All, you know, autistic people are all, you know, all around, you know, income level, ages, like two to 70 to 80, you know, forever works. So like all of these things, you need to consider what people are bringing with them. You know, their even, you know, their trauma history, you know, someone who came from uh, a, a good a good home life, you know, so to speak, whatever a good home life is, you know, who considers they had a good childhood, they're going to have a very different uh, experience and carry themselves different than someone who came from a violent environment uh, and someone who has more trauma that they carry with them. So like being really mindful uh, of these, these differences and these, these, these um, things that might impact people's lives that they carry with them that are invisible, that you cannot see, like being aware of the unseen uh, and also like really realizing that emotional safety has to be a cornerstone to pretty much everything else you're doing. Because if people in any kind of organization, whether it's a community or relationship, 
friendship, romance, uh, work, it doesn't really matter what kind of relationship it is. If the people in that relationship don't feel emotional safety with one another, they cannot speak their needs because they're not going to feel it's safe to do so. So if that emotional safety is not your core piece, and then also that comes with trust, like there has to be trust, like they have to trust that when they speak their needs, it's going to be, it's going to be handled. It's going to be recepted. Uh, and it's a place where you can have that safety and trust. Those things go hand in hand. Uh, and so like really paying attention to that. Uh, and after that, you know, you can figure out the policies in your group on your own because people will tell you like what's working, what's not working. And so you can use that to figure out what are the rules of the group? What, are the, what do we need to engage safely with one another? But the emotional safety really can, has to come first just so conversations can be genuine and authentic and people can speak about what their needs are or if something is bothering them. You know, it's really important to be able to speak up when something's bothering you or when you're not okay and know that people aren't going to dismiss you and tell you you're being too sensitive. Absolutely. And by Did we put it in a bow? <laughs> Sorry. As, did we tie it up in a bow? <laughs> I think you did a great job with that. Thank you. Just reading the, the energy in the room. Megan, are we at that, our awkward goodbye moments? Now? I, I, I think so. I think we are. I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation, Lyric, and I. This was great. Yeah. Thank you so much for. It was good. And can you tell everyone where they can find your book and anything else that you're offering right now because such a tremendous resource the the easiest way to find me is neurodivergentrebel.com because there's links to everything you want to find in the menu <laughs> perfect i love that answer <laughs> we'll have all of that in the show notes for you too so you have easy access to all of lyrics information you can buy their book check out their resources their consultation services etc thank you all so much it's really been fun i, I appreciate you both Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you. I always look at Megan out of my peripheral to be like, is Megan going to do the goodbye? But I can wait. I, I don't we know by now, Patrick, you, I, I if just, you want a really awkward goodbye, I will do it. But you always do the goodbye. You got some good shout outs when I wasn't in that episode. So, all right. Anyway. <laughs> To everyone listening to the Divergent Conversations podcast, new episodes are out every single Friday on all major platforms and YouTube. Like, download, subscribe, and share. Goodbye. As you may know from listening to our podcast, I've been working on a book, Self-Care for Autistic People, and I'm excited to announce it's out this month, both in physical form and as an audiobook. As a celebration of its release, I'd like to share some excerpts from the audiobook edition with you, our podcast listeners. The book is designed as a book you can pick up for brief, easy five-minute reads with over 100 different entries that introduce you to practices for incorporating self-care. You can find the audiobook wherever audiobooks are sold, available on March 19th. Many autistic people experience alexithymia, so I definitely had to include some entries on emotions. So here's an excerpt from the book on how to grasp difficult emotions. When I was in my first year of training to become a psychologist, one of the skills we learned was identifying and labeling other people's emotions. I observed classmates smoothly mastering these emotional reflection exercises, while I stared down at a long list of emotion words, struggling to know what to do with them. I couldn't help but wonder why these exercises felt so difficult for me. It wasn't until I discovered that I was autistic that my complex relationship with emotions started to make sense. I've always understood my internal landscape through concepts, ideas, analysis, and images. In contrast, the realm of emotions felt like an alien landscape. About half of autistic folks grapple with alexithymia, a condition causing difficulty in recognizing and naming emotions. If you can't pin down what you're feeling, boosting your emotional awareness and resilience becomes a tall order. This emotional opacity can hamper your ability to regulate emotions, understand your needs and wants, connect emotionally with others, and even connect to yourself. That's why fostering emotional awareness and literacy is essential. 
Here are some practices to help you amplify emotional awareness and literacy when emotions feel elusive. Visualize. Autistic brains often lean heavily on visual processing. Look online for tools like an emotion matrix, feeling wheel, or feeling list, which can help convert abstract emotions into concrete visual concepts. You can download several of these for free at neurodivergentinsights.com. Read. Fiction can offer valuable insights into emotions. Authors give us windows into characters' emotional landscapes, decoding emotions, intentions, and motivations, thus enhancing emotional understanding. Engage with music or photo prompts. Stimuli like music and photos can spark strong emotional responses. Use these prompts to practice diving deeper into your emotions and enhancing your emotional awareness. Journal for emotional awareness. Journaling provides an avenue for accessing your inner world in ways that spoken language often cannot. By journaling to identify and explore your emotions, you can increase your awareness of them. Additionally, you can find patterns and identify common themes, triggers, and more. The world of emotions may seem confusing and disorienting, but with practice, intentionality, and persistence, you will find it easier to navigate. However, Cultivating emotional awareness is not an overnight task. It's a journey. Some days it might feel like you're making huge strides, while others it might seem like you're back at square one. That's okay. Patience and persistence are your allies in this process. Over time, you'll notice patterns, gain insights, and understand yourself on a deeper level. Celebrate each small victory along the way. Every moment of awareness is a step forward on this journey of emotional literacy. Developing emotional awareness and literacy not only unlocks profound self-discovery, but also ushers in a richer understanding of the world. And here's another excerpt from the audiobook edition of Self-Care for Autistic People that touches on gratitude. I've always been sensitive to experiences where it feels as if someone is trying to manipulate an emotional response out of me, such as with motivational speakers. This is why I used to be a bit skeptical of things like gratitude practices, as they seemed like a form of self-manipulation. However, my perspective changed when I learned the neuroscience behind them and realized that my skepticism wasn't justified. Gratitude practices are not about manipulating yourself to feel something that isn't real. Instead, they prime your brain to be on the lookout for the things in your life that really do bring you joy, connection, meaning, and gratitude. They help balance out your brain and correct for confirmation bias. Your brain is naturally wired to seek out certain aspects of your environment. So, for example, if you're depressed, your mind tends to focus on negative thoughts about yourself, the world, and the future. Your brain is essentially filtering out anything that would go against your depression and laser focusing on the negative. Many autistic people are predisposed to view life through a more anxious or depressed lens, and cultivating gratitude can counteract that confirmation bias. By incorporating gratitude into your life, you provide a counterbalance, allowing you to shift your focus and actively seek out moments of goodness amid the challenges of life. Rather than blocking out the reality of your experience, gratitude offers a broader perspective and help you appreciate the positive aspects that may be easily overlooked. Starting a gratitude practice doesn't have to be a taxing endeavor. Here are three simple ways to incorporate gratitude into your life. One, think of three good things. At the end of each day, list three good things that happened. They could be as simple as a beautiful sunset you saw, a pleasant interaction, something delicious you ate, or something you did that you're proud of. Two, conduct a daily review. Replay the three good things from the day after you identify them. Over time, your brain will start actively seeking out similar moments throughout the day. Three, post gratitude reminders. Place visual reminders, such as sticky notes, in your environment to prompt you to pause and reflect on something you're grateful for. These practices gradually rewire your brain, expanding your capacity to notice and appreciate the positive aspects of life. Starting a gratitude practice is an intentional effort to recalibrate your thinking patterns and cultivate a more balanced outlook so you can more fully appreciate life's positive aspects.